go ahead and call to order the regularly scheduled meeting for December 22nd, 2020 of the Bristol Virginia City Council. Uh, please join me in a moment of silent prayer. Please join me in the Pledge to Allegiance. who has uh, turned out tonight, as well as those uh, watching online. I um, hope that everyone, it's our last meeting of the year, so I hope that everyone has a, a very happy holiday season. Uh, remembers the reason for the holidays and keeps that uh, hope alive as we move into the new year. And would encourage everyone to be very safe during their celebrations over the next couple of weeks uh, as we don't want to see increasing cases and hospitalizations uh, and things that may lead to shutting our businesses down or keeping our schools closed any longer than they have to. Um, one other comment I'll make is uh, tonight is the uh, last meeting for our city clerk. She'll be moving on to another position. I'd like to uh, thank her for all the work that she's done. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I'll just echo what the mayor said. Uh, to thank you to, to our clerk, to Nicole, for uh, the time she's put in with the city and, and with us specifically. I know that um, maybe sometimes it's not like herding cats with us, but it's like herding cats that are also on fire. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for everything you do and good luck in the future. Uh, before I move on to the city manager comment, I will make a note that uh, Councilman or Vice Mayor Farnham is participating online, and I think he has to s state the reason why. Yes. Would you please do that, Vice Mayor? Can you all hear me? Yes. I'm uh, voting in this meeting as a possible exposure to someone else who gets the boxes for COVID 19. Thank you. Uh, item B, city manager comments. Um, I'm just going to echo what Bill and Neil and everybody else has said. Nicole, um, you've been a tremendous asset to the city, an asset to me. Uh, you came in at a time when the city was under tremendous stress and um, offered a good sounding board for me. So I appreciate that. All right, uh, move on to item C, matters to be presented by members of the public. Uh, we have one person sign up, uh, Mr. Pollard. Thank you, members of the city council and the staff. Um, I just wanted to mention that it might be a good idea to increase the uh, frequency that the um, the cardboard bins are emptied because it seems that they are full uh, fairly regularly. I'm not sure if that's a scheduled event or if it has to be reported, um, so if someone's monitoring it and changing it as necessary, but it seems that it, uh, they are full fairly frequently when I go to take by some recycling cardboard. Um, every now and then there's been a mess by some of them, but it's been because of cardboard that people have been leaving by rather than the trash that we've seen in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Uh, if there's anyone else didn't sign up would like to speak now. Okay, item D, 
adoption of the agenda? Uh, I move for the adoption of the agenda as presented. I'll second. We have a <coughs> motion, Councilman Osborne. Second, Councilman Wingard. Uh, Clark, call the roll. Farnham. Yes. Bumpower. Yes. Osborne. Yes. Wingard. Yes. Hartley. Yes. All right. Item number one, presentation of the June 30th, 2020 audit report. Uh, staff report. Members of Council, Mr. Gordon Jones, Certified Public Accountant with Robinson Farmer Cox and Associates. Um, the auditors for the City of Bristol will present the audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2020. We'll add that both the comprehensive annual financial report and the audit presentation are available on the finance um, page of the website. Thank you, Ms. Bradlin. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, Mr. Eads, it's good to be with you all this evening. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I, I know I've met everyone on council, uh, but maybe people in the, in the audience don't know who I am. My name is Gordon Jones, and I'm partner in charge of the city's audit. Okay, um, you should, uh, Ms. Bradlin was nice enough to have a couple of items ready for you all. You should have an audit presentation. Uh, you should have the comprehensive annual report that has this nice pretty cover on it. And then there are some GASB pronouncements um, that will be adopted in future years. But uh, first thing I'm going to do is talk about the reports um, that we issue as part of your financial statements. Uh, they're in your CAFR. They're not part of this uh, document that's, that's up on the screen. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, First thing I want to talk about is on page seven of your comprehensive annual financial report. Um, it's the independent auditor's report. Um, it's and um, whoever's handling the screen. This is actually in the capper. It's in the in the capper. So on page seven of your capper, you have the independent auditor's report. It's a clean, unmodified report highest level of assurance you can receive. Can't, you can't make any improvements on that. Back in the back of the report on pages 134, 135, this is the government auditing standards report. It's the report on internal control and on compliance and other matters. Um, as in the past and, in, and since 2007, I believe it was, uh, we do have, we have one finding, it's an internal control finding related to the solid waste. Similar to last year, uh, no change in that finding. Over on pages 136 and 137, you have our uniform guidance report. It's also referred to as a single audit report. It's required when you expend federal funds in excess of $750,000. Uh, it's a clean, unmodified report. Any questions about those reports before I move on to the presentation? I will mention that um, the city is lucky in that it has a true comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, most of the financial statements in this area uh, wouldn't be considered a CAFR. Uh, they would just be called financial statements. Uh, to be a true CAFR, it has to have a, a statistical table that agrees with what they consider to be a true to statistical table. It has to have a letter of transmittal. It also has to have an MDNA. So uh, kudos to the finance department uh, for putting this together. Okay. Moving on to the audit presentation. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over on page two, you have our communication to those charged with governance. Uh, this is required by an auditing standard. I think it's statement on auditing standard 115, uh, thereabout. Um, this is a summary of the audit process. It uh, is a clean report. Nothing negative reported in here.
Over on page five, uh, we did have one management comment. Uh, management comments are items that we would like to bring to the um, attention of management that uh, don't rise to the level of a finding, a compliance finding or an internal control finding, but it's something we feel like needs to be addressed. Uh, we had one comment uh, regarding the Lee Highway project. Um, the amounts being paid on that project were exceeding the contracts. I'm not, not sure exactly what's going on there. Um, any questions about that? Okay, uh, let's move on to the, to the fun stuff, so to speak. Over on page six, uh, we, we pull some numbers out of the financial statements to give us some uh, information to talk about. Um, we don't have five years of data in the financial statements, so we pull it out and provide five years of data. Uh, I like this first schedule. Um, on top, uh, you have the city's balance sheet, so to speak, on a full accrual basis. Uh, and on the bottom, you have the city's balance sheet on a modified accrual basis. The books of the city are kept on two different bases of accounting. Um, this came about with GASB 34 about 17 or 18 years ago. But on the top, uh, under the 2020 column, Total net position for the city is about 11.1 million. Um, a lot of that is net investment and in capital assets of about $14.7 million. Your unrestricted net position on a full pro basis is a negative 3.9. And the reason it's a negative 3.9 uh, is because of some other liabilities that I'll talk about in a little bit. So just keep that in mind uh, when I get back in the back talking about the um, long-term debt. Down at the bottom, you have the governmental funds. Um, this is a short-term perspective. Uh, it's a modified accrual basis of accounting. Total assets of about 39 million. Um, total liabilities, 4.6. You have some deferred inflows of about 11.8 million. Uh, the important part are fund balances at the bottom. Um, for the year ending 2020, you had about $22.8 million in fund balance. Those are categorized um, based on a number of different, five different categories, uh, non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. Probably the most important piece of that is the unassigned piece. Uh, the city has about $17.5 million. That's about $9 million more than you had just four years ago in 2017. Total governmental expenditures for the city and the school board is about 77 million. Your fund balance as a percentage of that 77 million is about 30%. Unassigned balance is about 23%. We usually recommend somewhere between 15 and 20%. So contrasting these two balance sheets, so to speak, on a long-term perspective, you know, it doesn't look that good because you have some liabilities, long-term liabilities. On the short-term perspective, on the bottom, your, your financial statements look healthy. You have adequate fund balance. Um, so that's, that's just a uh, thing to note there. That's, that's what I point out. Um, down at the bottom, uh, just in 2017, you had 8.4, now you have 7.5, 17.5. It's an increase of about $9 million in the unassigned fund balance. Over on page seven, you have the solid waste fund. It's reported only on a full accrual basis of accounting. Um, total liabilities for that fund is about 48 million. Total assets of about 21.5. Net position is a negative $25.6 million. And that's due to the, that's the reason for the finding that we have in the, in the audit report. Net investment and in capital assets about $15.4 million. And you might ask, well, how in the world is that negative? Well, if you have assets and you're not paying off the debt, then at some point the liabilities become higher than the assets that they, that they financed. So then that ne number goes negative. Unrestricted is about a negative 10.1. Uh, and when I talk about long-term debt in that, in, the, in a little bit later on, 
you'll see why that number is at $10.1 negative million dollars, uh, mostly due to a landfill liability. Any questions about that? Uh, this year, uh, we pulled out the transit fund and showed it separately. Uh, not, a, not a whole lot of significance to report there other than it's shown as a separate fund now, which agrees with uh, government county standards. In the past, it's been inside the general fund. Over on page nine, you have five years of data for the general fund. The general fund is the main operating fund for the city. Um, all the way to the right, you have the 2020 numbers. Total revenues at about $55.6 million, increasing at less than a 10 percent, tenth of a percent. Uh, and I based that on the 2017 numbers. I didn't go back to the 2016. Those were uh, pre, uh, pre RFC and pre TAMR, so to speak. So uh, I felt like we could have better comparisons if we went back to 2017. Uh, total expenditures at about $54.4 million. Uh, operating expenditures increasing at about 1% over that four year period. Debt service at about 4.6, increasing at about 3.25%. Um, change in fund balance, the fund balance for the general fund increased by a little more than $2 million. Beginning fund balance was about $20.7 million, ended up with $22.8 million. Ending cash for the general fund was about $19.3 million. Contrast that to 2017. 2017, you had a little more than $7 million in the general fund balance, in the general fund. That's an increase of about $12 million in crash over a four-year period. That's pretty remarkable. And this excludes, this $19.3 million excludes the CARES or the CRF um, coronavirus funds that you have sitting in the general fund. So I've removed those uh, just to make it uh, a little more transparent. Over on page 10, uh, again, we're calculating the general fund reserve as a percentage of the operating expenditures, including the school board, and you can see how we calculated the $77 million there. Uh, fund balance as a percentage of that 77 is 29%, cash balance at about 25%, both safe numbers uh, on a fund balance level. Any questions about that? That's a lot, that's a big, big mouthful there. Any questions about the general fund? Okay, over on page 11, uh, you have some uh, pie charts comparing 2017 revenues for the general fund compared to 2020. Uh, not a whole lot of movement there. They almost look identical. Uh, on the bottom, you have the general fund expenditures comparing 2017 to 2020. Um, public works, uh, I noted uh, uh, health and welfare is up from 15%, that's the yellow piece, up from 15% to 18%, and then public works is up from 9% to 11%. Otherwise, it looks pretty consistent. Same type of information over on page 12, general fund revenues, uh, the major revenues over to the left, uh, some of the smaller revenues over to the right. Nothing real significant to report there. Expenditures in the general fund um, over on page 13 uh, look pretty, pretty constant. Um, and again, at 2016 columns are uh, previous accountants, previous auditors, so uh, may get some spikes in there. Okay, on the last couple pages here, pages 14 and 15, uh, I like to talk about debt uh, as part of my presentation. Uh, not, not a whole lot of change here. Um, one thing I'll point out is that uh, net pension liability for the city increased from about 18 million up to 20.37 million. Um, that's nothing the city has done uh, wrong, nothing that they haven't paid. Um, I assume that the, the actuaries that come up with these liabilities change their assumptions, which cause the liabilities to increase. Total long-term liabilities for the general fund, 
It's about 107 million. The solid waste fund has total long-term liabilities of about $47.7 million. Uh, that landfill closure liability is what makes the uh, net position or unrestricted net position for the solid waste fund negative. Remember, it was 10 point something million. Uh, the landfill closure liability is about $12 million. Without that landfill liability, it would be, be positive. And then below that, um, some of the other long-term liabilities have been allocated to the transit fund. Um, we, we include the school board liabilities, and you can see there that the pension liabilities for school also increased by about a million dollars. School board long-term liabilities about 28 million. The IDA revenue bonds at about 31 million. Total long-term liabilities for the city, including component units, about 215 million. Population of about 17,160. Debt per capita about 12,500. Uh, the statewide average for 2019 was about $7,500. So the, the city does have quite a bit of debt. Any questions about that? So um, I guess in conclusion, the audit went well. Um, comments were minor. Um, findings were the same finding that we've had since 2007, or actually we've, we've only had it for four years. Uh, it's been on the books since 2007. Um, it, it was a, a kind of a rough year getting the audit finished, thanks to the finance department for allowing us to do preliminary work from our office when everything was shut down back in the spring. Uh, that helped us get a little bit further along. So when we came in the fall, uh, we were able to finish up on time. Um, the last item that you have with you is our new GASB pronouncement. GASB is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Uh, there's a there's a list of probably seven or eight that are that'll be adopted in years um, coming up. Uh, this year we were supposed to adopt the first one on there, GASB 84, dealing with fiduciary funds. I don't think that'll have a huge impact on the city's books, uh, but it will be adopted in fiscal year 21. Um, the, the big one will be GASB 89 dealing with leases. Uh, the city does have a number of leases that will have to be accounted for differently um, uh, fiscal year 22. So they, uh, GASB was nice enough to uh, postpone these for a year. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to deal with any new GASB pronouncements for the current fiscal years, for current fiscal year. Okay, sorry I can't breathe in this thing very well. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, on GASB yes, 89, what'd you say on the leases? What's, what's gonna be accounted for differently on leases? Well, um, currently, uh, operating leases are note disclosure only. Um, if you've got a, an operating lease that you're gonna pay over the next five years, you just put that in the notes and say, this is what we'll have to pay for the next five years. When we adopt GASB 89, bear with me, uh, what will happen will, will, what will happen will be is that we will book an asset and it'll be an asset called um, uh, future rights to use this asset and we'll book a liability. It'll be a deferred inflow. The, the asset will be a deferred outflow and then the liability will be a deferred inflow. The two will offset so it won't impact your books that much. So, so you'll have an asset called right to use uh, this tractor. And then offsetting that will be a liability of deferred inflow that shows how much you're gonna pay for that asset over that five year period. Does that make sense? They, um, they made up these new um, accounts. They're called deferred inflows and deferred outflows. They're kind of like assets and liabilities, but not really. So then they had to figure out, well, how we're gonna use these crazy things. So they make up these GASBs to, so they can put some accounts in there. On, on the landfill, the, um, the landfill closure liability. Yes, sir. Did that include the current active landfill or, or the one that's already closed? It includes both. It includes that the includes one both. that you're mining. What's that? It includes the one that is closed 
not really closed, mining. Is that correct, Tim? Yes, it includes the old landfill, um, 498, and the new as well. It does. As well as a, a compost facility and, and yeah. a few other things True. in there. Yeah, there's about five pieces to it. Uh, the transfer station, the composting facility, the old landfill, the new landfill, and tire shredder. Yes. Okay, you said you were going to come back to like page six on the other liabilities on the 3.9 million negative um, unrestricted net where, position. Where are you? I'm sorry. On page, page six. six yep. Presentation? Yep. Okay, I'm there. On the uh, unrestricted 3.9 million in the, yes. 20, the 2020 column, you said yes. you were going to come yes, back sir. and explain that. Can you do that again? I think I missed that. Well, you, you can kind of flip back and forth between um, page 14. Page 14, at the top, you have the liabilities of the general fund, basically the general fund. It's, it's technically the governmental activities, the primary government of the city. You have about $29.8 million in other long-term liabilities. It includes a net pension liability, compensated absences, an OPEB or other post-employment benefit liability, and also a revenue sharing agreement. Those are about $29.8 million. Those numbers don't have, um, the, other, the other liabilities are offset by the assets, capital assets like buildings, equipment, uh, land, uh, those liabilities don't have anywhere to be offset. So they, they get netted from that unrestricted net position. So that's what's driving that negative 3.9. Without those estimates, those are estimated liabilities, 20, almost 30 million, not by us, they're estimates of actuaries. Without those liabilities, you're a positive 27 million unrestricted. And someone here, did you uh, did you review in the audit and make uh, statements about how we stack up to our financial policies relative to the <coughs> audit and the numbers? How, how we stack up to our financial policies relative to the audit, how these final numbers I guess came the fund balance policy? No, our, our internal city financial policies. Uh, we, we do tests related to that. I, I don't know specifically what you're well, looking Well, I'm for. curious on, you know, the policies we got on the, on the debt threshold and all the um, things we have in that policy if you if you audited that through this. I'm not sure what policy that, that is. And I'll just clarify, in our internal um, financial policies, a couple of years ago, um, Mr. Jones, we set some, some thresholds that are our goals. And I think um, what Mr. Mumpower is asking is, as part of the financial statement audit, um, did you test um, where we ended up compared to those policy goals? And I will tell you, um, that that normally is not part of a, a financial statement audit. That would be a that would be a, an additional type procedure. It's just not part of the financial statement audit. I would I would agree. With that. All right. So I would uh, I understand that. So I would suggest that we do that on the next audit if he can't do it this one because that that's healthy for the council and everybody to know that we're having a third party review where we are relative to our policies and are we moving forward in the right direction relative to our policies, right? because we spend a lot of time on those and they're important to us. So I'd like to see your take on each okay. one of those items. Will do. Okay. Any additional questions? Oh, that's a good audit, I thought. It, it, went, it went well. I would say if you look at the numbers close, it's my opinion the trends aren't in the right direction. I, if you look at how the revenue trends are and the expense trends, they're not they're they're not positive. If you look at the fund balance, though, they are positive. Yeah, that's positive, they're but the other trends aren't. I would just like to add. I want to thank uh, Mr. Jones and his staff. It was certainly an unusual year. I've been around local government and audits for quite some time, and I've not ever seen the challenges that auditing firms had this year and i'd like to thank you on behalf of the city for doing a quality audit and a timely audit thank for the you. city of bristol appreciate it thank Enjoy you working with the city. thank you mr jones we do thank appreciate you. that okay uh at this point do i have a motion to accept the comprehensive annual financial report for the city of bristol virginia for the year ending uh june 30th <coughs> 2020. uh i make that motion second Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Uh, 
Is that an echo or that was a phone second? <laughs> no, Mum Power went first and yeah. then Anthony <clears throat> chimed in right, the, I the, the, right immediately. So we have a motion by Councilman Osborne, second by Councilman Mum Power. And a third if you want it, I guess. Yeah, a third. Okay, uh, no discussion. Then uh, Clark, Caldwell. Farnham. Yes. Mum Power. Yes. Osborne. Yes. Wingard. Yes. Hartley. Yes. Okay, item two, public hearing regarding the performance year 19, not fiscal, PY, CDBG Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report caper. Open the public. At this point, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing and we'll have the staff report. So good evening. So the City of Bristol, Virginia is an annual recipient of federal funding through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is better known as HUD. The entitlement monies may be spent to develop or sustain viable urban communities by providing decent housing and a suitable living environment and by expanding economic opportunities, principally for low to moderate income persons. All entitlement monies received are dispersed through the City's CDBG program. The Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, better known as the CAPER, uh, for the City's CDBG program is an annual report for the City's use of this funding in carrying out its 2019 Annual Action Plan. This report has been made available to the public and is brought before the Council for public comment prior to its submission to HUD. Okay. Uh, I don't think we had anyone sign up to speak any, uh, any public comment or if there's anyone All right. if there's no public comment then I'll go ahead and close the public hearing thank you Ms. Tolton and we'll move to item number three a discussion of property assessments the staff report uh, Ms. Barker Good evening, Council. I'm Chloe Barker, Commissioner of the Revenue. Um, <clears throat> we're going to speak a little bit about the uh, reassessment. All the letters just went out recently for the general reassessment that's done every four years as required by the state because of our population. Um, this year's reassessment was conducted by Walter and Eames out of Dalesville, Virginia. They um, were hired by the city in 2016 to um, do the first reassessment. Prior to that, we had had a company for many years um, and the city council at that time decided they wanted a new uh, group to do the, do the reassessment. Um, the notices went out. Uh, we've had um, some local people call our office about that. Um, he can tell you more. Um, this is um, Agnew. He was, he was one of the assessors that did canvas the city. So, <laughs> so let me just say uh, we've been in business about 24 years. Proper names. We've done about 120 assessments, 53 different locations in, North, in, in North Carolina, Virginia. Uh, first time we've done about 2 million parcels all together in terms of all the properties we've looked at. When we started the job four years ago the first time, one of the things we noticed is that, um, and you also changed uh, systems, there was no neighborhooding in the uh, in the city. And it's, it's really hard that you just have one neighborhood, 11,000, 10,000 parcels in one neighborhood. And so one of the first things we did when we finished that job was we established neighborhoods. And we have about 50 of them in the uh, city now. It allows you to more accurately assess when you have properties neighborhood because obviously if you've got a subdivision, sometimes the values change differently in that subdivision than they do in another subdivision. So that was one of the first task uh, we accomplished. There's so much to do, you can't get it all done in one assessment sometimes. So the first thing we did is we established these different neighborhoods and um, and then we, uh, when, you, when you do this work, you send people out to validate what we have on record and make sure our sketches are right, decks and porches and all that kind of stuff. 
are accurate. And then we look at the sales and we compare uh, the values to what the sales are. And then we come up with, uh, uh, we're supposed to, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. So, if y'all don't hear me say something again, just let me know. So anyway, as I was saying, we, um, <clears throat> we uh, hit, hit the field and start looking at properties. And we send guys out to make sure our data is right. If the people are home, we'll talk to them, go over the property data card to make sure we have the right bathroom count and basements, all that kind of good stuff. If they're not, we'll leave a card behind for them to contact us. Once we get done, we uh, then study the sales and we come up with a new valuation based on what the market's telling us. Now the code sort of drives this process and we're supposed to assess it 100% of market value. And so <clears throat> for this particular job, we had, um, I think it was 10,080 parcels. We had about 521 sales just in the last 11 months. And that's significantly higher than what it's been in the previous times. And we had um, about 8,300 homes in that group. We had an average increase in the residential about 17%, an average increase in commercial about four, and multifamily about 9%. Now the notices went out a couple of weeks ago. Our average ratio, by the way, is right around 99%. That's the ratio of assessment to sales. We were supposed to be at 100. We like to be in the 97, 98% range or 99% range to make sure we're accurate. We had uh, notices went out about three, four weeks ago. So far I've tracked about 335 appeals. Um, I can just tell you that the majority of them, so far the biggest complaint is they're concerned about the taxes, obviously, because with a 17% increase, uh, they're concerned about their taxes going up. Um, I've probably talked to maybe 100 people so far. I call the ones back that want to be called back, or if I feel like there's enough evidence to warrant looking into the property further. Some people seem to values go up 30%. Those I'll generally give a call and just to find out if we've got some bad data. Yeah. Sometimes we just, basements for example, are one of the most common types of bad data we have because we don't go in people's homes. And when you go over somebody's information and you, your card shows you've got a finished basement but they say they don't, then we have to change that. And that can bring that value down some. And sometimes uh, that increase, if it's more than the, the 17, or this is 17 is an average, per, average increase. Some areas were 20. Some areas were five based on the neighborhoods. Sometimes you find that when we're out there in the field and we're talking to the homeowner and we go through the card and we say, I see you've got a basement, yep. Yeah. Um, is the basement finished? Yes. Well, we don't have it picked up as finished. So if we fix it right then, well, that bumps the value up right there and has nothing to do with the market. You know, So that can lead, lead to an even greater increase when you factor the market plus you know, fixing the, the data that was wrong before. So in any event, um, uh, we're working the appeals right now. I, I suggest that if any of you have, uh, you know, citizens that are upset about their assessment, please give us a call, file a petition. Uh, I want to talk to anybody that wants to talk to us and explain the process. And uh, we, want, we want the values, people to feel comfortable about the values we have. A lot of people aren't so concerned about the values as much as they're, they're just worried about the tax implications. They, you know, they say we, on a fixed income and don't know how we're going to, you know, handle this increase. I know there's the, the, um, the code, the, the real estate code addresses issues like this, but that's not my purview, you know, but, um, but so we, we're just finishing up handling the appeals right now. And when we get done, uh, we'll generate new notices to show the changes that we've made as a result of the appeals. And then, um, the next process will be the Board of Equalization. Any questions for me about the process or about what we do? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm gonna start off because it's a question I've heard from a lot of people, mm -hmm. including my wife, because mm -hmm. this has happened to us. Our, our real estate assessment went up close to 40%. Mm -hmm. I've heard people anywhere from 30, 40, up to one, per, one individual called me, it was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. All of these people, and, and ours is the same. The land value didn't go up. No, sir. But the value of the property, the value of the structure did. Right. And there has been no improvements right. to that structure in the last four years. So how in the world can you justify that level of increase when there has been nothing done to the property 
to, I mean, there has been nothing mm -hmm. added on. If right. somebody drove by, they would see nothing different. And, and I know in my case, and in a lot of the people I've talked to, the same situation. So what is driving that level? I mean, 10, 15 percent, some people, yeah. you know, they can understand that it appreciates over time. But to see that level of bump, what, what drives well, the, the, that? The, we, those, any, kind of, any situation like that, we need to dig into it. Um, example I just gave you, like I had a guy that's, that went up about 40 percent that I talked to. And it turned out that he had like a 1,500 square foot finished basement that we hadn't picked up before, right? It was, it's been finished for 15 years or 12 years, but we didn't know it until we knocked on the door and maybe several other assessments, they weren't home. And so when we, if they're home and we go over the card or we see it's been a sale, right? It was on, listed on the market and we look them up that way as well. If we find that the basement's finished and we hadn't had it picked up as finished previously, then we're gonna go ahead and pick it up now. Well, that's gonna, a finished basement, say 1,500 feet, that's gonna add about $25,000 to the value. And that may, that may be most of that 40%. And so I would just suggest if you've got increases of that amount, uh, we need to dig into the details and find out if something had changed. You know, we picked up something new that wasn't there before. But we, we, we don't want, uh, uh, you know, that's very unusual to have that kind of an increase. So I hope those people are calling me. Now well, we have a, I have a list of all the sales here that I ran. I've gone through it, and this will show us, you know, what the increases were. And we try to catch those. Something that goes up, 80 percent ought to be a red flag. But sometimes we miss them, and so I just would encourage you well, to have people and, contact us. And I will say the people that have contact, I've encouraged them to appeal to go through the process. Yes. Uh, you know, again. Uh, at the end of the day, we want uh, an accurate assessment, yes. and we can worry about the rate uh, yeah. when it comes time. But uh, a, you know, we want to make sure that their their uh, dwellings, their structures, their properties assessed right. And so I've encouraged them to go through that process. But yeah. again, that and it, you know, people of course are going to the you're going to get the most extreme cases in terms of complaints. That's yeah. where you're going to get the most complaints. Yeah. So you know, but. A lot of people have been in that very high range complaining and, and the common theme is, you know, I don't mind, I can see a little bit, but mm -hmm. this is very extreme and I have done nothing to right. my property. Right. Right. And I think that's where they need to hear whatever that explanation is. And it sounds like it could be a case by case thing. It, it is. And, and, and I agree with it. We want it to be accurate too, because it's a reflection on us, you know. So. Um, I just yeah, definitely want to hear from anybody that's got an increase like that. Now, you know, something can be as simple as um, just a data entry error, you know? Could have been, I've, I've, I was working down at Smith Mountain Lake one time and somebody had a 24 by 24 boat dock and it got keyed in as a 240 foot by 240 foot boat dock, you know? And so we didn't catch it. And you know, when you've got 40,000 properties or 11,000 properties, uh, the ones that you get right, you don't hear much about. It's always the ones that are wrong, but we want to hear about those ones that are wrong because we don't want those kind of errors sitting out there. We want to find out what it is. Okay. Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, I own a property a couple blocks from, from the mayor's house, and, and ours only went up by like $5,000. So I would assume they're, I would assume it's um, classified in the same neighborhood, right? So, so how did yeah. you, I know you said that there had been no neighborhoods. Yeah, well, at the last, in the how first, did you determine that? The first time, you try to do it based on, Obviously, a, a subdivision is real easy, you know, because you've got like homes, and so, you know, you know, if you're in a subdivision that's got 40, 50, 60 homes, you, you go ahead and you establish a neighborhood for it, give it a number, and then that way you can kind of track when you're looking at your sales, is this neighborhood, are the, are the average properties in this neighborhood selling, is there a greater increase happening in this neighborhood, say, than another neighborhood? And um, uh, then you get into some of the more Oh, gosh, like when you go down Airport Road and you've got little branches off there, we, we try to keep similar like properties. We have a grading system, an ABC grading system. A C-grade house is sort of an average ranch, you know, typical pitch roof. It's pretty much an average build, builder grade, uh, you know, builder grade type uh, um, quality inside. And so rather than, so though we try to group those types of homes together, you know, and you've got some parts of the city, as you know, that, Gosh, every third or fourth house is a is a poor condition or fair condition house. And another thing we saw this time that was 
I mean, compared to last time, was a ton of, uh, of um, rehab, I mean, houses that had been flipped, uh, purchased for when they were in poor condition for ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, and then they were fixed up. Now, that's not the example you're talking about, but those have gone up sometimes 300%, you know. But anybody that hadn't done anything to their house or, or their property, and it's gone up 50, 70 percent, we, we need to know about that. We need to find out what, what's going on. Now, my guess would be it's a data entry issue or something like that, but that should not be a normal case. Now, I've had some people say, well, I haven't done anything to my property. How could it go up 15 percent? You know, well, same thing way stock does. If the market, right now, we're in a situation, I mean, I was blown away myself. We, we came, we started this job in late 19. And the field work was done by April, so it's a small job, 11, 10,000 parcels. So when we finished that, you know, it wasn't a huge increase, maybe 10%. Well, just another eight months later, when I went in to crunch the numbers for this job, I, I was blown away, but I wasn't totally surprised because we have jobs going on in Carroll County and Wythe County, and we were starting to see this crazy market. And if you guys have been picking up, paying attention to real estate, talk to any real estate person, they'll tell you. We got a we got a market now where there's no inventory. If you put something on the market, it'll be gone in days. I mean, this is nuts, and so it's created this huge demand. Building costs are way up. Like a two, uh, I think the last time I checked, OSB gone from fifteen dollars to about forty-five bucks for a piece of OSB. Two by fours had almost doubled in cost. So that's put a lesser stress. That's there's less new construction going on, and so it's pushed it to uh, you know resales. But I just talked to Lauren Griffin the other day, a real estate agent here, and she was saying they're dying for inventory, you know, and it's everywhere. It's Roanoke, everywhere we are, we are. It's it's a crazy market. And it's actually harder, you know, in doing this work to, to find that place, that value, when you've got a dynamic market like this. Where does it stop, you know? And so we have to cut it off. We cut it off in uh, in uh, July, in uh, November, and that was, we had 500 and something sales just in that 11 months. About another 30, 40 sales may have gone through now. So it does make it a little tougher to do this, but we definitely want to hear about these really crazy increases. So I know you mentioned um, there'd been 335 appeals. What's that, sir? You said there'd been 335 appeals. Appeals so far, and I expect, actually, I felt like that number was pretty low considering the yeah. amount of increase we had. What's the, what's the timeline or the turnaround for uh, the, to, to Tomorrow is the last day, yeah. and usually um, I'm, try I'm getting to them once I get them on my desk, I'm usually getting to them within a day or two. Okay. And I, what I'm trying to do is with COVID, you know, we can't have the meetings face to face. So I'm calling them, I'm leaving them messages on my cell phone even, you know, so, um, and most people will call me back if, if, you know, they don't get me the first time. And then sometimes I'll just go ahead and make some changes based on what I think may be right, you know, but, but if it's um, like I had one sale, one lady called me and uh, she had like completely remodeled the outside of the house, right? So we didn't, we didn't go inside, so we, we bumped that one a decent amount because it, it went from an average condition to a good condition house. Well, she called me and she goes, we've got it in the inside. It was, we had leaks and stuff in the roof. Now, if I had known that, uh, I, I wouldn't have known, you know? So, so that's why we've got to have this meeting of the mind, so to speak, before we finalize these numbers so we know that what we have is, because we just make assumptions sound based on the outside, you know, because we don't want to be peeking in windows. But this house had a new roof and new siding and new windows, but she said she'd had a roof leak and had to gut it, and they're just kind of do it in phases, and they just finish the outside first. I will say I know when I was, um, when I was running two years ago, <clears throat> I met a very sweet old couple um, that they had, that had happened, they had had something happen where all of a sudden they had been told they had a new basement. Yeah, and the guy was up in his 80s, and he was like, "I've had a crawl space for 50 years. I've never had a basement, and it got fixed really quick." Yeah. So, yeah. so I do appreciate, you know, when you when you hear about the problem, you you address it pretty quick. Yeah, we do want to address it. So, I, please, we want to, we're just as concerned about the acres as you are, because it's a reflection on on us. You know, we care about it being right. Did you say the uh, sales price of the properties? I think 521. You said uh, went up 17 percent on the. The, on the average sale price. residential was about 17 percent. Okay. Commercial is four, and multifamily. And the uh, multifamily is about nine. And what was the, what was the, is that from July 19 to July 20? Is that the time period of those we, sales we, increases? Uh, these, these sales were, uh, were covered most of, most of 20 sales, but some 19. Some were 19. Yeah, but, okay. but most, mostly, these are mostly the 20. We tried to focus more on the later sales, just like any appraising, any appraising would look at the latest sales, you know. So most people would expect 
the assessment of their home to go up 17 percent. No, who, who would? Who would? I mean, we haven't seen an increase. No, I said that's the market. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's the market. Yeah. So you say everybody would expect it to go up at least yeah, 17 yeah. on average because yeah, that's where the yeah, market. Yeah, moves. right. Okay. Right. Right. But if you're not in the market, if you don't know the market, <laughs> I, I, I can feel for these people. If you're not in it like we are, you know, you're shocked to get an increase like that. You know, if you don't know what's going on in the market. And so I can understand, uh, especially when the past, what, 12, 12, 13, 14 years, it's been relatively flat, comparatively you, speaking. Now that you have neighborhoods, do you take three or four properties that have sold recently in the neighborhoods to see if your assessed value and what's sold recently in the neighborhood are on par? Yeah. Yeah, that's what, like, like I've got one I've got to take another look at now. And, uh, and you just hope that you have some sales in that neighborhood, you know, because if you don't, you got to try to find a comparable neighborhood, you know, to... to but what we'll do is we'll look at those sales and we'll try to, uh, you try to um, eliminate like outliers. You know, if I had, for example, three sales, let's see these, the homes in this neighborhood are running 250, for example. And I've got three sales and one's 249 and one's 239 and one's 290. Uh, my first thought is, well, what's going on with this 290? So when I look into it, and let's say they're on the same time frame. If it looks like it's the same square footage, same finish, pretty much the same house, I'm not going to chase that 290. I'm going to use the other two sales and throw that 290 out. And so, frankly, sometimes you find people coming from other areas like New York or something, New Jersey, they don't know the market. So they'll pay 290 for a house compared to where they're coming from, you know, because it's just mm -hmm. a. But we do try to look at the average sales and not chase any one sale. <coughs> Well, I've got my share of phone calls like everybody else, yeah. <clears throat> and I, I am a little bit knowledgeable of real estate. The problem <clears throat> is these massive increases hit at one time. Mm -hmm. We have a city here that 50% of our people in this city get some kind of benefits from, social, from mm -hmm. the Department of Social Services. We are a low income community. Yeah. And we have a lot of retirees here that's on fixed incomes. Yeah. And <clears throat> when their house increases by 30, 40, 50%, that is devastating to them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you ask a simple question well, is your house worth what it's just got tax assessed for? Mm -hmm. The vast majority will say, yeah, my house is worth that. The problem lies in <clears throat> something has went wrong pre in prior assessment years that has suppressed the value of the properties. Mm -hmm. Now it's coming more to a light. <clears throat> it's not that the houses for the most part, which some of them are overtaxed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say that because yeah. I got yeah. I got my tax tickets yeah. in. <clears throat> but uh, the problem is such a huge increase at one time. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a major shocker, especially to somebody that's on a fixed income. So <clears throat> I don't know what the law is and how it reads, but if this city could do something on its end, and I'm just going to throw this out here, and it may be a stupid comment, but I don't care. If we could set a policy in place that we have some kind of policy that we as a city don't increase the value of these properties over the rate of inflation annually to gradually take them up to where they should be without it being a complete shocker. I don't know if we can do that or not, but the rate of inf we can't do that, says the city attorney. Okay. Mm -hmm. The, so, there's the state code, it's 58.1. Uh, 3321. That's it. That, okay. That, that <clears throat> says that assessment shall be at the fair market value of the property. Okay. But in a situation like this, with these kind of increases, we could potentially tax a retired person on a fixed income out of their house. And that is not a position we want to be in in this city. You've got, you've got widows out there making six and seven hundred dollars a month in their, in their benefits. 
and then they get a 40% increase on their taxes in one year, and they've been struggling all year long, we've, we've got to do something. We've got to put some thought into this. Well, and the other thing is the gentleman made a comment about you know, somebody remodeled the outside of their house. We want people to fix their houses up and clean this city up. And if we throw 30 and 40 and 50% tax increases at them, we have taken away all incentives to clean this city up. We've got a lot of work to do. We, we need to figure this out. And Councilman Wingard, in regards to that, once the appeals process is complete, the Board of Equalization is complete, we will get a book value of what the property assessment is in the city. And just like that happened in 2017, I can't speak for council, uh, but my, the recommendation I think that you will get from management will be that the tax rate needs to be adjusted so that people's taxes do not go up. And that's something that we will have to do late March, early April, when we set the tax rate. And I'll just add to that. When I've been talking to people, uh, again, I tell them I, I can't speak for council, but my intention is not to, as it was four years ago, not to use this as a back doorway to a tax increase. But we're looking at an aggregate amount. They still need to appeal their individual properties yeah. because that will affect them individually yes. and we also again back to the point want to make sure that that no aggregate number is as accurate as possible when we do set the rate yes i want to say, i want to say one thing about the 521 straight sales that we have had from january through november of this year <clears throat> it is an increase the amount above the appraisal that we have on the books that was set in, uh, went into effect January 1, 2017, $10,809,000 increase. Now, that includes um, all the sales where there was money exchanged, whether the value, whether they gave less for the property or whether they gave more for it. So people's really paying a lot more for these properties than what we had it on the books for. I understand that, and I'm into real estate to some degree. Mm -hmm. And I saw the trend in 2006, 2007, mm -hmm. and I kept telling everybody, this is crazy, this cannot last. It will not last. People are off the charts. Well, we're heading that same way again. Mm -hmm. And this bubble, too, will bust. It's just when and how much. So <clears throat> we really need to be careful because people, in my opinion, there are a lot of sales that's taken place that they've paid more than they're worth. Mm -hmm. They paid more than they're worth. And if you use those numbers on the rest of the people, then they're being overtaxed because <clears throat> What you see on the outside may not be a true reflection of what you see when you open that door. Yeah. So we got to be careful. Ms. Barker, what would that $10 million be on a, on a percent increase of the base book value of the assessed properties? I'm not sure. You'd have to know what the assessments were. All that. Yeah. I just, I just have the, the increase per month down. I mean, that's just, that's just the increase of what people paid over what we had it on the books at. It's okay. the 10 million. And that's for 521 sales. I mean, there's been a lot more transfers and things well, during the, the year. Well, if but the total assessed, you know, aggregate, right, mm -hmm. rises X percent, that's a number that's important to us, right? Mm -hmm. Where did that go relative to that was the total this? Assessment. Yeah. So 10 percent of that would be 13 million. Yeah, I can't really give you the figure right now. Okay. Well, get that to us when you can. That's an important number to know where that where that moves. Okay. 
Travis. So are you telling us then we should expect the aggregate to go up 17%? Well, actually, no, we're making adjustments. The people that are calling in and we're finding mistakes, I'm, I'm bringing them down, a lot of them. You know, like, give me just an example. Somebody may call up and, I'm, and we've got their house in good condition. Good condition for us, for our system means, say it's a 60-year-old house. To be in good condition, we expect to find some major remodel going on. You know, uh, an average condition house in our, in our system is a house that's just been maintained. But if we find out it's been remodeled, kitchen, bathrooms, roof, you know, the whole nine yards, it's a, it changes from average to good, which is just another method of reducing depreciation or changing the effective age of the house. Well, I've had quite a few that we had in good condition. And after I talked to the homeowner, I said, well, I've been in this house, you know, it's built in 1970. It's got the same kitchen in it, same bathrooms. Well, I take that good off and put it to average. Well, that'll drop it 15% right there. So that's why it's crucial that we have a meeting of the minds and, and make sure we're on the same page. And if we don't have that contact, we don't, we don't know if we're right, like you said. You know, you don't know what it's like until you get inside. And so there's some that we have a, we have a code called uh, interior superior to exterior, where you look at a house that looks pretty plain Jane, you get inside and it's granite, new hardwood floors. I mean, it t knock your socks off Taj Mahal inside, but outside looks pretty, pretty, you know, just plain Jane. They don't want that tax deal. No. So it, you see all kinds of different, different things, you know. So, um, but we want the data to be accurate. I, I think Mr. Farnham wanted to ask a question. Oh. Hey guys, just a quick comment. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I just wanted to chime in and say a few things. I've heard a lot of uh, uh, stuff I agree with. I just full disclosure, I'm also a, a licensed real estate broker in the state of Virginia, so I, I agree with the gentleman that, that we have uh, such a small supply of inventory um, and a lot of sales. Need to take a good hard look at that and try to figure that out. So, thank you. Any other comment? Questions? One thing, and, and uh, for the audience here, for people watching, for Mr. McGee, hopefully he'll include this in tomorrow morning's article. Uh, walk us through what the steps are. I think you said tomorrow. I thought the notice said the 24th, but well, man, uh, I, I, I thought it was the 23rd. But if it's the 24th, that's fine. And we're but, not but, gonna. Well, and I was gonna oh. say, what's the? You, you said call. I think the notice said to to do it in writing by email, or or make sure people understand what what they can do yeah. when they can do it, and then you know that's the first step. There's also the board, you know other yes. steps along the way. Yeah. Just to make sure people know what to do if they. Yeah. Uh, well, this first process is called the Board of Assessors, and I thought the date was the 23rd, but maybe it's the 24th. They can either fax, they can call uh, the office and make an appeal over the phone mm -hmm. and email. So, and then, and then once we get through that process and have some kind of contact with them and go over the information, uh, if, and then we send out new notices on the new, what's gonna, ha as a result of those appeals, and then there'll be another process called the Board of Equalization, where if we don't, Satisfy them. They can go before the board of equalization, and that'll be announced in the in the uh, second notice that goes out, and that'll be in the springtime. Because okay. I know traditionally they could come and, and meet in person, but because of COVID yes. this year, that that opportunity wasn't there. And, right. And and that's one thing I do appreciate you coming, kind of explaining some of this. Because again, as you say, uh, when you when you have that chance to sit there and talk and back and forth, oh, yeah. uh, it, it's very helpful for oh. people to understand what. Yeah. you're looking at as well as you understanding their individual situations. Yeah. So. yeah. The two-way communication is vital on this because it's your biggest asset and you want to make sure we've got the right information. Okay. <clears throat> well, I have one more comment. <clears throat> Y'all done the uh, tax assessment in 2017? Yes. This is your second time in, in the city here. What can we do to position ourselves or do whatever we need to do to where four years from now, 
when we have this city reassessed again, and I'm just going to assume you're going to get it, what can we do or you do to where we don't freak people out with 40, 50, 60, 70 percent increases? This needs to be the only year we blow well, people's minds. You know what I guess we could do? This one caught us by surprise because I think probably have a meeting before, you know, have some kind of communication before the numbers go out so we can say this is what we're seeing, you know, um, in terms of increases. This caught us by surprise because um, the biggest portion of this, and I think that my real estate friends would agree, has happened in the last six to eight months. It, it's been crazy. I, I, I know that. <laughs> and and I, I'm like you. I'm wondering, <laughs> is this going to be another one of those 2006, 2007 that the bubble's going to burst? It's going but, to. But we have these low rates, right? I mean, these mortgage rates are the lowest I've seen. And my, I'm 65. I've never seen them. Two and three quarter percent, 30 years. I know. And I don't see any, from a financial, I don't see any change in the rates in the near future, you know. Um, but there is a, there's a lack of inventory now, right? So what do you do with that? I mean, I'm trying to sell one. And it is true, uh, I've got one in Benton, Virginia, and I, I'm trying to max it out, you know. You know, and that may be how people are paying more because of demand. And I've tried to, even in my work, I was telling you, I try to eliminate the outliers, you know. And sometimes, if somebody's coming from another area, uh, and I see the house, I, I think they pay too much for it, just on my, based on what I know. Uh, I'll tell them sometimes. I had a, uh, one, in, I was working in, uh, in Pilot, and I came up on this house, and God paid 270 for it, and I, it wasn't worth more than 240 So when I got to the door, I was praying that he had finished the basement so I could hit that number. He hadn't. And so I told him, I said, I'm telling you, when your numbers come out, it ain't, it's not going to hit you 270 We're going to be about 30000 below what you paid for it. I can't justify the number. I don't have sales to back it up. And guess where he was from? He's from uh, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I said, how did you feel about the purchase of that? He said, I got a steal. Mm -hmm. I stole it. <laughs> and I said, what would this be worth in Massachusetts? About 800000 Well, it was two and, two and a half, three acres. Yeah, Massachusetts probably would be. Wife was from California. So I try to pull those sales out and throw them out. And not, we have an expression in our business, don't chase a sale. That's one you don't want to chase. You know? so, but it's, it's mass appraisal. It's got its inherent weaknesses compared to a fee appraisal. But we want to do a good job. <coughs> and um, there's so many issues that can come up, data issues, whatever. So that's what we've got to have. I want these people calling me so we, I can talk to them. I have just one quick question. Um, sure. Out of the number of appeals that you have heard so far, mm -hmm. What's the percentage that are changed and that's not due to a mistake, like a data entry mistake? Like they're, they're changed due to just market, uh, make, it, make it a market issue? Right. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, probably, uh, that's probably going to be maybe about 10% because one of the things I have noticed is we've got some issues with the townhome and condo uh, valuation. So I'm actually pulling those entire communities and taking another look at them. And so we just didn't have a whole lot of townhome sales, you know? And so, so you, if you don't, you, you find an area where you did have a townhome sale and you say, well, I'm going to try to apply that to this townhome community, but th that just doesn't work. So I'm going to be actually, I've got probably three or four townhome communities. I'm pulling the entire complexes and I'm revaluing those. And so those are going to be market. I mean, there are mistakes on my part, you know, because I, I overstated the market in those areas. So, um, so and that's why this 17 percent. It may be 15 when we when we've made all the adjustments. You know, that may, that number may come down to 15 percent instead of 17. And you know, one thing we talked about: uh, do we blend them? Do we blend them? That's another possible. You, you ask, what do you do if it happens again? Do we blend the 19 and the 18? the 20 uh, increases, but then the state might get on us, you know? Why are you doing that? You know, why are you assessing it at 90% uh, of market or 95% of market? That's already happened in Franklin County. We finished that job up in 20, and, I, and the state did some study work in, in the mid-20 sales, and our ratio in that county is about 85%. We're supposed to be at a 99 to 100. So it's like when you got these dynamic markets, it's, hard, it's a moving target. You know, so, but I think to answer your question, maybe 
meeting sometime before, if we have some indication that the market's going to be going crazy before we get to the point we send the notices out. Does well, so? and, and to, you know, to the appraiser's credit and you all and you're doing your job, I mean, you've gone back, you've seen there's 500 and some odd sales over the past 11 months. Yeah. Um, that's always probably going to drive a price up. Oh, and, yeah, I would um, say so. Yeah. You know, being able to warn the community four years from now, I think is going to be difficult because we don't know what the market's going to bear here over the next four years. I mean, we yeah. could be on the cusp of a bubble and things could drop. Yeah. We could just be at the very beginning of an increase yeah. that we haven't seen yet. So uh, I think people just need to pay attention yeah. and see what's going on because ultimately the law requires properties to be assessed at the fair market value. And the only way to know what the fair market value is is actually what's going on in the market at yeah. the time. And yeah. Well, yeah, I understand that. But here, here's another thing, too. <clears throat> and it, it's a really delicate balancing, balancing act. But here, I'm just going to throw this number out there. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know the number. Mm -hmm. But let's just say there's 7,000 homes in this city. And I don't know yeah. if there's, I don't know what I think know that's pretty close. I think we found about 8,000, didn't we? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, and you, you've got data showing sales of 500 and plus homes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's 6,500 homes that did not sell. You're right. Yeah. That's 6,500 homes that didn't have a whole lot of renovation work done to them to put them out there on the market to sell. Uh -huh. So the numbers that you're coming up with, the 500 that did sell per square footage, has no bearing whatsoever on the 6,500 that was not sold, yeah. that's being lived in and being used and depreciate, not depreciating, but, you know, being, you know, uh, lived in. Right. So <clears throat> it's a real fine balance in that. It but is. I don't want to see where we're crippling hardworking families with huge tax yeah. increases and freaking them out. You know, they get, they get, they open that letter up, they get home five o'clock in the afternoon, open up the mail at 5.30, get ready to sit down to eat, open up the mail and find out they had an increase of 40, 50, 60%. They ain't gonna sleep that night. Yeah. Yeah, but ultimately, Mr. Wingard, whatever the assessment is, does not impact their tax bill as long as we do our job on the back end when we set the tax rates. I understand that, but the general public does not know that when they open that mail. Well, and and we are freaking and, them out. Well, and we have to go on an education yeah. tour to make sure people understand that. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me to, to get to your point, part of this in four years, um, I think as you start the assessment process to explain to people, have you come uh, and explain what, what the process is, uh -huh. how it works, kind of where the market is at that point. Yeah. As you pointed out, if you did done that in, at the end, a year ago when mm -hmm. you started this, you would have said the market looks this way. It's uh -huh. changed in a year. So, I mean, you know, and again, as, as you go through the process, if you see something that looks like, hey, we, we need to let the community yeah. know this so they don't, because I think that's your point, that people kind of know what to expect and don't, just open the mail one day and say, you know, my house has went up 50% in the last four years. I haven't done anything to it. You know, that yeah. that's a shock. And then the way that that's written, it says, and if the tax rate stays the same, this is what what it would be. They don't understand that, you know, we, we can't change the rate. They just see that and think, you know, that's a lot of money. So uh, I think on both of those points, you know, the can communication we, is, is real crucial. We actually did that in Russell County years ago. We could see we could see it was going to be a big increase. So we actually had a town hall meeting where the residents were invited. About six months before the numbers came out. And we told them what we'd seen. We showed them slides and showed them the sales and what was happening. So that's not a bad idea. And then I want to, I want to address something you said. Let's say we got in that, that family you were talking about that gets that notice. Let's say right next door to them is a house just like it. And let's say their house, both the houses are assessed around $60,000. And the house next door sells for hundred. So when we get that sale, we're gonna look at it. We're gonna look at the MLS listing. We're gonna look inside that house. 
And we're going to see if that house is over 100, and this one's over here at 60, and we see that house has been remodeled inside, that house is going to get changed a good bit. And that's not going to necessarily affect the house next door. So let's say we find out that the house, next, both of them are average condition. We got this sale of this one. We get, look into it. We find out, man, that thing's been remodeled. It's got a finished basement. You know, we're going to pick all that up. And so that's going to take that value up maybe to uh, say this so for, say for 85. And then, the, then it'll kick to 100 with the market influence. Whereas the other one was at 60, it'll kick maybe 15% up to 70. So we're not going to raise that house to the left to the value of this one to the right just because it sold for that much unless it had nothing done to it and it sold for 100. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So yeah. we do, we work these sales. Uh, we, we work them, we, we make sure that, uh, that we picked up all the changes. Because when a house sells that much more, something's been done to it. And you, you, you can usually tell. So we don't just take that guy's house and left and raise his to, to hit this sale because that house has been improved. So we do try to, don't catch them all, but we try to catch that kind of stuff. I understand that. Yeah. It's just okay. that, that I know the percentage shock. is a shocker. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I would say if you've got somebody that's 40%, we need to look at it. There's something not right. I, I want to hear from all of well, I had a, I had a couple go up 40 plus percent and yeah. a family member went up 100. Yeah, yeah, I want, I want to hear about that. You already have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had 100, one, you ain't I, heard from me on the 40s. Yeah, all right, I had one pill, I want a pill. <laughs> Guy said, he, and he looked at how much it went up. Now, he bought the property in 19. He paid 125 for it or whatever, and we had it assessed at 122. But he noticed it had gone up, you know, 30 or percent or so. And he said, how can that happen in just a short period of time? Well, he paid, a, we had it below what he paid for it, unless he paid too much for it, you know. So I didn't spend much time with that one. Yeah. But assessments are not an easy business sometimes, you know, because you're trying to, trying to make something fit. And, but uh, we want to hear from everybody that's got an issue. Any, any more comments or questions? Well, again, uh, we appreciate the work you're doing. We appreciate you coming this evening to, to explain the process, to answer questions. And uh, uh, again, I encourage anyone uh, that, that has questions and, and about the assessment to contact you please and uh again because i think at the end of the day everyone wants to see the most accurate number yeah. uh, possible yes sir all right thank you god bless y'all have a merry christmas right. thank you thank you you too all right uh move to the consent agenda what is the pleasure of council uh, i move for approval of the consent agenda as presented okay. we have a second Motion, Councilman Osborne, a second by Councilman Wingard. Clark, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Hartley? Yes. All right. Being no further business, we stand adjourned. <laughs>